My name's Rob Butler and I'm a structural geologist but I spend quite a lot of time looking at deep water sandstones, the depositional products of turbidity currents. These are turbidites and I like to apply concepts from structural geology to try and help me understand the depositional processes of these rocks. So let's go and see how we can apply these ideas. But let's start off looking at some beautiful, almost type examples of turbidite sandstones. Well, here's a really classic example, isn't there, of this nice parallel lamination. And it goes up into these zones of disturbed fabric, disturbed depositional lamination. It's convolute lamination. Little package up here of a bit more parallel. And then this really nice package on top with more of this disturbed or convolute lamination. Well, let's have a look at the convolute lamination in a little detail. So let's just follow some of the lamination around. Well, we could pick this prominent package across here like this, forming this elevated area or an antiform really, coming down into a trough here or a small synform. We can see the synform here has got lamination that's folded as much as everything else at the base. And then you've got these laminations banking down into it, building out. But by the time you're at the top here, you can see the lamination just go straight across. So clearly, this trough has formed, it's been filled and banked in by the sedimentation. We take these sediments back across onto this side and they're still folding as this structure is continuing to presumably subside and grow. And we can see eventually this one gets banked out as we go further up. So lamination is filling these troughs. The convolutions are being filled as they form. So the critical observation here is that the lamination decays upwards through these folds. In other words, the lamination was depositing as the folds grew, their growth strata, in exactly the same way as you see um, syn uh, kinematic sedimentation around folds in uh, thrust belts, for example, or on rotating normal fault blocks. So sedimentation as the seabed was deforming So that's what convolute lamination looks like in profile. But the really neat thing about these outcrops here, we get them in 3D and we can look down on a bedding plane and see what these little domes and basins look like in plan view. Really nice bedding plane just here. Well, there's some crazy shapes on here. Look at these swirls and so forth. as the domes and the basins sort of are sitting up and down like this on this surface. So three dimensions, these folds are really quite complicated and they make crazy shapes in a bedding plane slice of these various laminations. So when seen on bedding planes, convolute lamination, really complicated structures. So what's the origin of convolute lamination like this? Well, for some geologists, convolute lamination record past earthquakes. They're things called seismites. In other words, you deposit the sediments and then it's mobilized through ground shaking. I don't think that's correct. First of all, there are a number of really key observations here. First of all, it occurs cyclically. So I'm on one package of convolute lamination. We then had aggradation of this parallel laminated material and then more convolute, a little bit of parallel, more convolute and so forth, more convolute lamination up on the level about my head height. So the convolute lamination intimately related with the other parts of the sandstone succession in here and it's occurring cyclically. Well, of course, earthquakes can occur cyclically. 
So that in itself is not the whole uh, reason for rejecting these as being earthquake orig originating. Why aren't these disturbed? The parallel lamination material isn't disturbed at all, it's parallel laminated and that occurs throughout. So why is the ground shaking restricted to very thin layers if there were seismites? For me the nail in the coffin though is that the lamination in the convolute lamination itself shows growth. So the deformation that makes the folds happens as the deposition is occurring. Now, of course, turbidity currents could be triggered by earthquakes, but this is not at the site of the trigger. This is at the site of the deposition, which could be, well, even hundreds of kilometers away from where the turbidity current originated from. So put this together, and I think it's far more likely that convolute lamination is part of the dynamics of turbidity currents shearing their immediately deposited substrate as they aggrade the seabed and they're showing evolution of that shearing coupling as the deposit forms. Well, it's not just the convolute lamination that we could interpret in these deposits as being um, caused by shearing of turbidity currents over their aggrading substrate. The parallel lamination is another indicator as well. In the convolute lamination, that shearing has coupled down and involves uh, several laminae, so you get the fold structures. In the parallel lamination, that coupling is just one grain thick, the thickness of the lamination itself and the process aligns the grains, not only to make the, the uh, lamination a planar fabric, but also aligns the slight elongation shapes of the grains themselves. They're not perfectly spherical, they'll be elliptical, uh, ellipsoidal, and the long axes line up uh, in the flow direction. It's called flow lineation uh, in sedimentology, at least by some sedimentologists. And we can see it really nicely preserved on bedding planes where they're fresh. Unfortunately on the coast here many of them have been uh, acted on by the sea and they're hard to spot but on this fallen block here there's a really nice example of this linear fabric on the lamination surface. So here's a loose block. You may pick out a subtle grain alignment just picked out by the sun which is the aligned grains on the plane of the lamination. So you can interpret these rocks as a structural geologist would interpret them. We can interpret the growth folding of the convolute lamination and demonstrate it forms during the flow, the turbidity current going across uh, its aggrading seabed. And similarly with the parallel lamination, we can do the same thing. In fact, this parallel lamination has got a lamination and it's got a aligned grain shape as a lineation. In structural geology, we call these LS tectonite. And in many ways, we interpret them the same way. The fabrics, the linear and planar fabrics are due to the flow dynamics not of uh, a thrush sheet making a marlinite, but of a turbidity current running across its aggrading seabed. So the kinematics of flow can be seen in these deposits and we can reconstruct how the shearing is coupling into the aggrading seabed as the deposit is depositing. So let's consider a turbidity current running over the seabed. And of course there'll be a velocity gradient decaying downwards towards the seabed and that in turn will exert on the seabed a shear stress. And that shear stress may be sufficient for the substrate to the flow to deform. We can think of this as a kinematic boundary layer to the turbidity current, preserved in its substrate. In the examples we've looked at so far, that shear strain profile 
is preserved within a deposit from an earlier part of the flow itself. In the two examples we looked at, parallel lamination and convolute lamination. These differ from one another because for parallel lamination, the shear strain at any given time is only one grain thick, a single lamellae, within which the grains are repacked, creating the flow lineation, defined by aligned grain shapes. In convolute lamination, that shear strain profile at any given time involves several lamellae, creating fold structures. The varying thickness of the kinematic boundary layer creates different structures. So the strain localizes differently through time as the sediment has aggraded in these deposits. But these aren't the only types of kinematic boundary layers we can interpret within turbinite sandstones. Well, sometimes within these uh, turbidite successions, you see structures that first, fa first sight appear somewhat ambiguous as to their origin. Let's look at this structure here. So, a unit that's got intense folding and deformation. You might interpret it to be uh, due to mass transport and flow um, of that unit in its own right. But if you trace it along, you find something different that says that's unlikely. So these parts of the bed still have got primary lamination and depositional structures that haven't been deformed. The deformation is patchy along the bed. So for me, it's far more likely that this deformation is not due to mass wasting of that particular layer, but to, due to shear of the turbidity current that deposits the bed on top. In other words, the turbidity current deformed the seabed as it rode over it, shearing it as it went. It's slightly different to some of the structures we've seen so far, where we've interpreted the structures as due to deformation of the deposit of the turbidity current itself as later parts of the flow pass over. Here, no, it's the pre-existing deposit, the seabed itself, that's been deformed. So I'm walking up the top of one sandstone, thick sandstone units. There's a thinner bedded package on top, and then a big thick sandstone on top of that. Let's look what's going on here. So some really nice burrow structures on the bedding plane that's the top of this thick sandstone unit. So from the burrowed bedding plane top on this sandstone, we go on to the finer, fine, very fine sands and siltstones. And here's this coarse sandstone on top, and there's its base. But as we come up through the finer grain material, we can see it's primary lamination, and then it becomes really gloopy, folded and disturbed, and then even looks sheared as you approach the base of the sandstone. Follow it along. And it almost injects into it. So, quite a good way of explaining this, I think, is you have a primary sort of silt fine sandstone deposit, and then as the turbidity current comes over the top, shears that substrate, mobilizing it, uh, injecting it up into the lower part of the aggraded deposit left by the turbidity current. So, another boundary layer type of behavior uh, in these sandstones. So, in these examples, it's the substrate the original seabed that has deformed. And of course, it means that the structure in these layers do, do not relate to depositional processes of that specific layer, uh, 
but to the dynamics of the turbidity current that overran it, maybe hundreds of years later. So we've seen different examples of kinematic boundary layers. So let's put these into context for an individual turbidity current. If the boundary layer shear happens before the turbidity current deposits, so towards the head of the flow, as it first arrives across the seabed, then we'll find deformed substrate potentially decapitated by the turbidite deposited for, by the flow that created the shear. If the boundary layer shear deformation happens after some of the deposition from the flow itself, so some of the deposits from that turbidity current will be deformed. For example, the parallel lamination and the convolute lamination that we saw in our first examples. So depending on the timing of the shear strain versus deposition, we can get a whole variety of sedimentary structures preserved in turbidite sandstones. You can get an idea of the range of these in this simple cartoon. Sometimes we might have undeformed turbidite sandstones that decapitate deformed layers. In these situations, the kinematic boundary layer shear strains have developed before deposition from the turbidity current that caused that deformation. However, deposits from the flow itself may be deformed by subsequent parts of the same flow. There's a whole variety of possible relationships here. But not all early deformation in turbidite sandstones has to relate to these boundary layer behaviours. So these are some pretty thick sandstones. They're amalgamated. You see this granular, very coarse sand here grading up. But look at the top part of the sandstone. That's what we've come here to see. The bedding is contorted. It's deformed as the top sandstone's dewatered. If we go onto the top surface, we can see the sort of frozen in boils of sand that come up onto the upper bedding plane. So look at all these crazy boily shapes up on the top surface here. Let's take a closer look. So not all the fabrics that we see in these turbidite sandstones are caused by the depositing turbidity current. Sometimes, like we've just seen there, the sandstone's deposited and then it's dewatered and turns over completely so we see deformation through the entire bed and recorded on the bed top itself. So it's important to be able to discriminate between these two types of process, syn depositional and post depositional deformation of these sandstones. So a short tour through some turbidite sandstones on the coast of Tuscany and an illustration of how I like to apply structural geology to help me understand the sedimentary processes that formed them. If you're interested you can find out more from this paper.